In this portion of our Worldviews and Values class, we're now going to look at another early modern philosopher, this, this time a British person named Thomas Hobbes, and we're going to look at one of his works. He wrote quite a few other books as well, but we're going to look at the one that's considered to be his masterwork, the one that has made the greatest impact on the history of ideas and indeed on, on modern culture in general, and it's called Leviathan. Now, we're only going to look at certain sections of it, in part because it's a massive work and we don't have the time to go into it. It'd probably take a whole semester to go through the entirety of the work in, in the detail it requires, but also because we want to focus in on the portions that have to do most with the great themes of this class, which are human nature, human society, and the reality that encompasses both of them in which we, we find human beings. So, as usual, with all of these works, we want to pay very close attention to three main things as we're, we're going into them. One of them is the literary genre of the work. The other uh, that we have to pay close attention to is very important in the case of this work is historical context. And then we'll talk about several of the main themes that you should be attentive to, you should be on the lookout for, as we go through Leviathan. What are the most important things that you need to know about the literary genre of Leviathan so you can take that into account as you're reading the work? I'm going to tell you a few things about it. One thing I want to say right at the beginning, though, is that we are looking at excerpts from the work, so we're not looking at the work in its totality. So some of what I'm going to say here might strike you as a little bit off, but if you were to look at the whole work in which, you know, the portions that we're looking at are coming from, this would make uh, complete sense to you. So the, the very first thing that I need to say, and the most important thing, is that what Hobbes is writing here is a philosophical and, and indeed an attempt to be scientific treatise. Now when we use that term treatise, what we mean is a very systematic, comprehensive work that is, is going through, um, you know, part by part by part, subject matter by subject matter, in a coherent, orderly way, trying to bring everything together. And if you looked at Hobbes' Leviathan as a whole, you would see that it has all sorts of chapters covering all sorts of topics, and it's, it's done in, in what Hobbes wants to be a proper ordering of things. And he's trying to provide you with, you might say, a one-stop shop in, in a book of philosophy that can cover everything that's important to, to talk about, at least as far as the main topics that he's interested in, which are political and moral philosophy. But you're going to notice that in this, this treatise, he's not just going to stick to ethics or moral philosophy or political or social philosophy. He's also going to cover a lot of other ground because he thinks that those things are important. So he's going to talk about what we call epistemology or, you know, the theory of knowledge or theory of what truth means or, you know, being able to distinguish between different forms of knowledge, you know, how, how the senses are connected with thought, are connected with memory, are connected with imagination, and whose, whose theories we should pay attention to and whose we should dismiss. He's also going to be connecting this up with an underlying metaphysics, a theory of what is most real. Um, we're going to talk about that in a moment. So these are all going to coincide with each other, and he's, he's putting out a, a theory where he's attempting to be the person who, once and for all, provides a truly systematic scientific viewpoint on things, in part because he thinks nobody else has done it up until his, his time. Now, another thing that I do have to tell you about this that you're going to want to pay attention to going, on, uh, going, going in very early on is that Hobbes is writing in the 16th century, but unlike many of the other people that we've read so far, he is writing in English. He is one of the early modern English writers. And there's a few things that you need to know about the way in which they wrote back then that will help you out. One is that they didn't spell things exactly the same way that we did. And so if you look at certain versions of Thomas Hobbes' work, you'll see you know, we spelled W-E-E, -E, and not meaning we little, but we as in you and me together. Um, you're going to see a lot of, of what we call 
unusual orthography. Now, in, in the versions of the text that, that we're going to use, um, we're, we're looking at a more modernized version of it. But the, the, the syntax, the grammar, the, the articulation, the style is also a rather, from our perspective, rather archaic way of speaking. So he's going to use words that you're going to recognize, but they might be used in ways that are a little bit different than you're used to seeing them. So you want to pay close attention to what's being said. Don't automatically assume that you know, just because it's written in English, exactly what Hobbes is saying. Um, approach this as you would um, a play by Shakespeare, which is, you know, not, not exactly the same time, but, you know, roughly in the same time period. Um, you want to, to read through these things carefully. In 17th, 18th, even 19th century English, as opposed to the way that people often like to write in, in the 20th century and today, it was quite common to have complex thoughts ordered in a paragraph. And there was a lot of attention to the structure of thought that was going on there. So Hobbes himself is doing that. You don't want to try to read through this very quickly. You want to pay very close attention and read through it slowly, even meditatively. Uh, that way you'll get everything out of it that you can. Um, another thing that I do want to point out, and this is probably the last thing that needs to be said about genre, is that in a philosophical treatise, one of the things that you're going to do is engage other possible viewpoints, either present viewpoints or past viewpoints, or even just viewpoints that you think you might be encountering in the future. And Hobbes is attempting to do that. So you're going to see him talking, for example, about the schoolmen. Those were the, um, the establishment of the, the English Academy of his day, the scholastic philosophers, who were by and large losing their, their, their intellectual influence and their role in the culture, but were still quite powerful in Hobbes' time. Hobbes is setting himself up as a critic and even an enemy of them. So he's going to be very critical of their point of view. And you might say, well, why is he criticizing them? Because he thought that was important at the time. I think you can probably disregard these references as you're reading it today, because there aren't a lot of schoolmen around. But if you want to, to understand the fuller context of what Hobbes is talking about, it, it's important to look at those. So that's what you need to know about genre. Now, what is it helpful for you to know or to take into account as far as historical context goes? We can say much of the same things of Hobbes as we could say about Descartes or other of his early modern contemporaries. And as a matter of fact, Hobbes really in many respects, can share with Descartes the title, the father of modern philosophy, because Descartes is in some respects a father of modern philosophy as far as metaphysics and epistemology goes, setting the agenda, you know, um, giving some, some basic ideas that are going to uh, be engaged with by others. Hobbes is doing that in terms of ethics and political philosophy, and also, if you pay close attention, in terms of, of metaphysics as well. And so Hobbes is, is at the beginning of a, a really interesting era in, in the field of ideas. But there's also a lot that's going on in the, in the broader world in which ideas have a major role, indeed a, a revolutionary role and a, a troubling role um, that Hobbes is going to be quite concerned with. Hobbes is born in, in uh, 1588, and he's going to die in, in 1679. So he spans roughly um, an, almost you know, an entire century. It's, it's not quite a century, but it's, um, it's quite a while. And he is born uh, prematurely because his mother hears the news about the Spanish Armada that's about to invade England. We'll talk just a little bit about what that means in a second, but what I want to clue you into is this really lapidary phrase that has been used since then. Hobbes says in his, his own typical laconic way um, that he was born a twin to fear. That is, his mother was in fear at the time, and that's why he was born early, and then Hobbes himself is born. So he's a child of his time. He's not only a child of his mother, he's a child of the fear of his, his time, of an era of uncertainty, an era 
of danger, an era of conflict. The Spanish Armada was set to invade England. It was a gigantic fleet, and it carried not only you know cannons and things like that, but a lot of soldiers. This was the the last serious attempt uh, of an invader to try to invade Britain itself. Um, and it might have succeeded had the, the fleet not foundered in, in the middle of a storm. So, you know, the English were, were really quite worried about this. And, and why was the Armada invading England? Well, one of the things that was going on was Europe had broken apart, not only into separate kingdoms, because those existed before, but into um, separate interpretations of the Christian religion. This is in the middle of the Protestant Reformation. And Protestants and Catholics were fighting with each other. Some countries were explicitly aligned with the Catholic Church, like Spain and France, although France was in the middle of a conflict between Protestants and, and Catholics for a long time. England was a Protestant country because King Henry VIII had, in effect, nationalized the British Church and declared himself for the Protestant side. Germany was divided between Catholics and Protestants. Sweden, had be, which was a major power at that time, had gone Protestant. Italy, of course, was, was Catholic, but although Italy was divided into a number of states, Austria was Catholic. Um, there were a lot of different, you know, developments going on at that time that were, that were quite uh, important. And so we can talk about religious conflict as, as something very significant. We can also talk about a lot of other kinds of conflict that are often overlapping with or coinciding with religious conflict. The religious conflict, by the way, was not just between Catholic and Protestant. It was also between Catholic and Protestant and other Protestant and other Protestant the Protestant Reformation very quickly breaks into a number of different denominational families or traditions. So the Calvinists were just as opposed to the Lutherans as they were to the Catholics. Um, the Anabaptists, from which we get the Mennonites and the Amish, they were you know, a branch that was getting essentially persecuted by everybody. Um, and, and we can say a lot about other things along those lines, but I don't want to go too, too deep into the detail. Because I want to talk about some of the other forms of conflict that were going on. There was also national conflict. Um, sometimes, you know, this, the, the wars of religion, and there were indeed wars that were fought on the basis of religion, provided a pretext for different countries to, to consolidate their own power. France was uh, particularly given to this, um, it, not so much in Hobbes's time, but a little bit later, as, as we're going to see. Um, England, of course, you know, the, the king had nationalized the church so that, that, you know, allowed him to do things like close all the monasteries, take all their wealth, distribute it to people that he liked, um, to, to go after people who, who remained Catholic in, in the country as well. He didn't do that so much, but, but some of his successors did that. Um, so there was, there was a lot of intra, um, national conflict as well. Um, and there was conflict within nations, and some of that was, was fought on, on denominational lines, but quite a lot of it had to do with what we can call class lines. Um, there's a lot of economic transformations that are taking place during this time. Uh, some of these involve dislocations, so, you know, the, the uh, prospects for the peasants become bad in some areas, and then the peasants are, are prone to say things like, well, this system is, is really out of whack, we've got to change this, things need to, to be uh, affected, and, and usually the other social classes don't like that. At the same time, we're seeing the rise of the bourgeoisie, the rise of originally the, the burghers, the people from the towns, the rise of them to, to positions of prominence uh, through trade, uh, in part because, you know, at this time, they, they were, the Europeans were expanding trade to the newly discovered, uh, from the European perspective, of course, Americas, expanded trade throughout Africa, expanded trade with, with Asia, and um, there were a lot of new, new you know, developments that were taking place because of this, a lot of economic changes. So some people are rising. Uh, the traditional nobility are finding their power in many respects hemmed in and curbed, not only by the rise of the new rich, the bourgeoisie, but also because um, the, the, the aristocrats tended to be troublesome. They tended to make a lot of uh, conflict on their own within a kingdom because they liked running their own show. And the kings, who are now newly powerful, 
try to prevent that. They say, you know, you got to rein this in. We're, you know, we'll let you do military campaigns, but no more of this fighting amongst yourselves. Um, so a lot of those sorts of transformations are taking place. Um, Hobbes himself is going to be not only witnessing this as a spectator on the scene, but he's also going to be affected by this as an Englishman. Um, England is going to go through a civil war, which Hobbes is going to write a history of in one of his other works, The Behemoth, and I'll talk more about that brilliant work in, in a few minutes. Um, Hobbes is going to end up, um, you know, siding with absolute monarchy in part because he sees what happens when factions are fighting with each other. You know, the, the factions that at first seem to be, you know, the only games in town, um, they fight with each other. Once they become weakened enough, somebody else is going to come in from the outside and take over. And that's what ended up happening under the Puritans and Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell, in effect, produces the first totalitarian state in modern Europe um, under the Protectorate. And, um, a lot, and it's not only bad for the English in many respects, but bad for the Irish as well, because, you know, a lot of things happen uh, in, in what was seen as a colony at the time. In any case, Hobbes is observing all of this conflict, and that's part of what's motivating him. He wants to try to find some way in which we can not only understand the conflicts that are taking place, not only judge who's right and who's wrong, but put an end to this kind of conflict, at least within a nation, once and for all. And he thinks that political science is going to make that possible, if it's the right kind of political science. Um, Hobbes himself is born of a fairly, you know, um, common background. His father is most likely a, a vicar, you know, a, a sort of low-ranking church official. We don't know an awful lot about his ancestry. He eventually becomes, he goes to university where he more or less pursues his own course of study because he doesn't really like what they're doing, uh, the schoolmen. And he ends up becoming associated with the Cavendish family. Um, he ends up becoming the tutor to um, William Cavendish and then accompanies him in 1610 on what's called the Grand Tour. A lot of times people from aristocratic families, in order to round out their education in England, they would send them and they would travel around Europe and observe human beings and, and you know, draw conclusions and sow some wild oats, hopefully not, you know, engender any, any children. But, um, you know, they would they'd kind of have a good time before they would come home and settle down as a fully rounded individual. So Hobbes gets to go to Paris uh, among other places. And while he's there, he starts making acquaintances because there's a really booming intellectual life going on, not just in Paris, but, you know, with sort of tendrils out to all sorts of other areas. And who's part of that? Not only this guy, Moran Marsen, who, who is a major connector of people, but also Rene Descartes. And Hobbes uh, ends up actually writing the third set of objections to Descartes' meditations. This gives you an idea about how important Hobbes was in the intellectual culture of the time. Um, Descartes really doesn't like in, engaging with Hobbes and, and doesn't pursue it much after that. Hobbes tries to, to write some more to Descartes, and Descartes kind of gives him the cold shoulder. But Hobbes is becoming established as an important intellectual figure, not only in the British scene, but on the European scene as well. Um, he's also coming into contact with a, a new approach to things, the modern scientific viewpoint on things, which tends to be materialistic, tends to view things in terms of mechanism, dismiss all the notion of like final causes and intentions in nature, you know, get rid of Aristotle, we're going for Galileo instead. You know, how much can we mathematize things? That's, that's what all of this is, is about. And it's a bold new venture, which is going to be, as it turns out, in many respects, you know, mistaken about this and that and this, but also it turns out to be very right about a lot of other things as well. You know, they're discovering that gravity works the way that now we understand it works. Um, they're discovering that this has applications for ballistics, for how you shoot, ca you know, cannonballs out of a cannon. Um, and Hobbes is very impressed by this. So you're going to see him making reference to, you know, discussions about motion and about sense. That's where this, this whole empirical and also rationalist uh, tendency in Hobbes is, is coming from. Um, 
He's also going to be discussing things like, like natural law and natural rights. This is a, another set of ideas that are floating around in the air because people are trying to make sense out of all the conflicts that are taking place and being able to say who's in the right and who's in the wrong. In addition, they have to figure out what are they going to do with all these natives in these countries that they're encountering. Do they have rights? Do they have natural rights? You know, they don't seem to be living in the same kind of commonwealths or kingdoms that, that Europeans are. How should we understand them? So Hobbes is trying to make sense out of that as well. Um, another thing that I should tell you about, about Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan is, is probably his most important work. It's the one that cemented his reputation and also drew a lot of criticisms from uh, many other thinkers, uh, not only in his own time, uh, one guy actually wrote the, uh, the hooking of the Leviathan, you know, Leviathan is this great sea creature, and so the idea is you pull it out of the sea by means of argument. But he's also been criticized, um, you know, down through the, the centuries, all the way to the present. At the same time, a lot of his ideas seem to have, you know, a recurring value as we look at conflict situations uh, and how we should deal with them. Now, Hobbes wrote a number of other works. Um, he wrote a, a, a trilogy um, um, on the citizen, on body, and the elements of law, much of which actually is going to show up in Leviathan. And these tended to, to get published without his permission. He would circulate works among the, the other people who were interested in this sort of thing, and then somebody would, without his permission, publish it. And then, you know, Thomas Hobbes would quite often get criticized by somebody who really didn't have any business reading the work because Hobbes hadn't authorized it. He wrote a number of other works like that as well where, you know, it'd be circulated, get published, somebody would say, aha, see, look at this guy. And Hobbes would be like, man, I, I you know, I didn't want that to be public, uh, public uh, uh, you know, discussion at this point in time. But that happened. Hobbes also engaged, interestingly enough, in translation work. Um, one of the works that he translates very early on, which you can tell has an important influence on him, if you've read it, is Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, a time when things were breaking down in the Greek world and people were acting pretty badly in relation to each other, and it looked like force and fraud were much more powerful than law or, or right. Um, later on in his life, he's going to translate Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. And he also, you know, engages in some discussion of rhetoric. He's, he's sort of a, a Renaissance man after, of course, the Renaissance, because we're talking about the early modern period. But a Renaissance man in, in, the, idea, in the sense that he, he understood and contributed to a lot of different fields. So that's probably enough. Oh, before I, I finish, one other work that I'd mentioned I, I, I would tell you about, Behemoth. So Leviathan is one biblical creature. The behemoth is another. These are both mentioned in the book of Job. And the Leviathan is Hobbes' theoretical work where he's talking about how societies work, how they break down, what human nature is like, all these sorts of things from a theoretical perspective with some historical discussion, but not an awful lot. Behemoth is the historical application of Leviathan, and it discusses the breakdown in, in civil order in British society leading to a civil war and eventually to the, the takeover by the, the Puritans and, and uh, Cromwell and all the things that ensue because of that. So um, Behemoth is, is actually well worth reading if you're interested in seeing how Hobbes got his ideas, and how his ideas would play out. So that's, that's enough about historical context, I think. What are a few of the really major themes that you should be on the lookout for, that are running throughout this work, that are the things we want to pay close attention to in Thomas Hobbes' perspective? Well, from the very beginning, you can say that, that Hobbes is adopting a not only materialist, but also 
mechanist view of nature, which includes human beings. So he's going to say we don't have anything like a soul or a mind that's independent of our body. All we really have are bodies, and bodies are indeed mechanisms like this pen, you know. They, they perform certain tasks. It's based on how they're put together. So that's one key theme. Uh, another important feature of Hobbes' work that you're going to see running throughout as well is a criticism and rejection of all previous positions that have been worked out on the, the topics that he is talking about, particularly when it comes to moral and political philosophy. Um, another thing that's coming out of the mechanistic and uh, uh, materialist um, metaphysics that Hobbes has is his emphasis on sense and movement as being what's fundamental in the workings of the human mind. So he will say, for example, that imagination is just decayed sense. And what he means by decayed sense is from our senses we're perceiving things which make an impression on, on our body, you know, we would say through our nerves, and then that impression is somehow stored and, and a reverberation is still going on within our, 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 our mechanism. Uh, our brain somehow. Um, going beyond that, he also talks about the interconnection between language and thought and how much of our thought is dependent upon our uses of language. Now, as we move on and we start looking at how the human being works, not just in terms of thinking, but in terms of feeling and, and movement and action, we see that another key theme is what Hobbes calls endeavor, and it's, it's two forms in desire and aversion as being the most basic fundamental movements that all of our other human action is ultimately composed of. Um, as we go through looking at how this plays out, we see Hobbes discussing, and this is another important theme, the human passions, the, the d different feelings, the different experiences, affects that we have, uh, ranging from you know, desire to fear to anger to joy to love to hate to contempt. And all of these can be understood, according to Hobbes, according to this mechanistic view of the human being. Um, something else that's going to go along with that, so here's another key theme, is that moral valuations like good, bad, just, unjust, uh, beautiful, ugly, uh, useful, and, and harmful are not really fixed. They depend on the situation, they depend on the human being who is making the determination. So that there really is nothing that is fundamentally always across the board good, nor is there anything that's always fundamentally across the board bad. Uh, there's a kind of relativism to Hobbes' morals outside of the civil society. Another key idea that you're going to encounter is the famous state of nature, where life is nasty, brutish, and short, because there's no governing um, authority, and anybody does whatever they want, which means that they're going to come into conflict with each other, which means that we all have to live in constant fear, we can't accomplish anything, anything that we do build or grow could be taken away from us at any moment, because we can do that to other people. Um, he also discusses three different sources of conflict in the state of nature that make it so, so dangerous. And these stem from our animal nature, but also our distinctively human nature. Um, how do we get out of that? Well, this is where Hobbes talks about a social contract and the transition to what he calls civil society. And in a social contract, we all agree to give up certain rights that we have in the state of nature so that other people will also give up those rights and we can all live in a state of more or less harmony with each other. There will still be some criminality, but we can, we can get along with each other. Um, something else that's another key theme are the laws of nature, and these are discovered by reason as the conditions that we all have to abide by in order to live in civil society and to not violate the social contract. The last theme for the readings that we're looking at that's really key for Hobbes is what he calls the sovereign. And the sovereign is a 
person who's placed in a position of authority above everybody else, and this is necessary in Hobbes' view in order for the social contract to work, in order for us to get out of and stay out of the state of nature, because without some sort of authority who can compel us to actually follow through on our commitments, he thinks that human nature is we will renege on our commitments and do the wrong thing and thereby break society down back into the state of nature. If we're rational, we realize, Hobbes says, that we need an absolute authority figure over us or else everything's liable to descend into chaos. So those are the key themes that you should focus on.